and answer session of today's call. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your host, Cheryl Piasecki. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Ethics Fundamental Series. Um, I'm Cheryl Kane Piasecki, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Diana Viu. She is the chief of our legal, external affairs, and performance branch, um, which is responsible for general law matters for, for the Office of Government Ethics. Um, and she is with us today to talk about um, ethics enforcement and all that that entails. So I want to welcome Diana. Thank you. We're very pleased to have her because Diana is supremely well qualified to speak on these matters. Um, as I mentioned, she's not only the chief of effectively our general law branch so that she deals with personnel law matters for OGE, but prior to coming to OGE, she had a 15-year career in the private sector um, representing private clients um, and federal agencies before the MSPB, the EEOC, um, in circuit court, I understand, um, with respect to federal personnel law. And so she's been around the block a time or two when it comes to, to matters of personnel law and, and enforcement. Um, so I think uh, we're very lucky to have Diana with us today to share the wealth of experience that she's had in, in her private career and also in her career with, uh, with, uh, with the Office of Government Ethics. Um, but before I turn it over to Diana, I do have a few announcements um, I'd like to make. First, next week for our Advanced Practitioner Series, we're very fortunate, that's May 21st, we're very fortunate to have uh, Anna Galinda Marone, who is the Chief of the Hatch Act Unit at the Office of Special Counsel, and she's going to come and speak to us about uh, the various Hatch Act restrictions and some of the most current trending um, things that are occurring with, uh, with the Hatch Act uh, provisions. Um, I believe she's going to be joined by her deputy as well. Uh, so get that on your calendar for next Thursday, the 21st at noon. Next month for our fundamental series, we're going to finally be bringing you a session on the gifts between employees provisions. Uh, we've never done a session on that before, and I know that it's been long overdue. Um, so get that on your calendars for the fundamental series for the, for the June fundamental series. And then next month as well, I know that there are many of you who were not have not been able to attend the live training that we're providing in DC. Um, and so what we're going to do is, at least for the post-employment portion of that training, we're going to be providing you a MOOC, a massive open online course, through the Google Hangouts at the end of June. That will be June 23rd through the 25th. We will be providing exactly the same content that we've been providing in the live training, um, obviously through, the, through a distance learning mechanism. Uh, but we will be going out with announcements about that fairly soon. So again, if you weren't able to attend our live training, we are going to bring that training to you uh, via a massive open online course. Um, and I think all my announcements are, are completed, so with, uh, without further ado, um, oh, I just wanted to let, I'm sorry, Patrick has, has, has uh, confirmed for me that I have forgotten something. Um, we are going to be taking questions uh, throughout the broadcast today. From, um, so if you're on the Google Hangout and you have questions, please do submit them through the Hangout. For those of you who are on the phone line, um, we will be taking phone call, uh, we'll be opening the phone lines at the end to take any questions that you may have for Diana. So now, without further ado, Patrick, if you can bring up uh, Diana's slides, um, and we will allow Diana to, to begin her presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, thank you, and thank you for joining me on, in talking about essentials in ethics enforcement. As Cheryl uh, said in her kind, kind description of my background, I have had a lot of private sector experience, but I also want to highlight that I have um, 10 years of experience in the public sector as well handling uh, primarily the same sorts of actions um, involving personnel actions against federal employees, so, uh, well, involving federal employees. And so, so I think that uh, experience and that background has made this topic particularly interesting to me, and I hope that you find it also interesting today. First of all, I want to give you a bit of a roadmap about what we're going to be covering today in our Essentials and Ethics Enforcement. Um, we're going to be talking about what is enforcement and ethics, and that includes what kinds of activities uh, are included when we talk about ethics and enforcement. Um, we also we're going to talk about the ethics officials' role in the federal disciplinary process. That's kind of and in, in encompassing that. I want to talk about a bit of an overview of the federal disciplinary process and what the ethics officials' role might be in that process. 
Also, I want to give a bit of an overview about the MSPB appeal process. Uh, the MSPB is the place where federal employees go when they want to challenge discipline that's been issued to them. So obviously, the MSPB's views about ethics infractions is very important to uh, those of us in the ethics community who will be looking at uh, dealing with those, uh, those decisions in our everyday duties with advising and counseling employees. And finally, uh, we want to talk about uh, some MSPB cases that are uh, that sort of are illustrative of a how the MSPB views some of these cases when they involve ethics infractions, and also how the MSPB has interpreted the regulations that are in the standard of conduct, in particular uh, regulations that we deal with at, uh, in the ethics community. So the first question I want to pose out there for you is a query, what is ethics enforcement? And we know what we're enforcing, and that is um, the conflict of interest laws that are found at 18 U.S. Code, um, and we also uh, the standards of conduct that are found at 2635. However, I mean, you know, it encompassed in that are lots of different activities besides dis the disciplinary actions that we're going to be talking about later on today in our presentation. And so I want to go over just a few of those things that, that our ethics officials do. So some of the traditional roles of ethics officials involve administering the ethics program in, edu in providing education, counseling, and advice to federal employees on ethics issues. And now these are issues I think most people would agree are really intended to prevent violations of the ethics laws and regulations. But we still think that they are enforcement activities because they assist in the observance of ethics laws and regulations by federal employees. And if you look up what the word enforcement means, the dictionary version says that it means to compel observance of. So I, you know, I always like to bring out a dictionary when I'm posed sort of pondering topics like this to say what, what does Webster say and how can I incorporate that into our understanding. So, uh, so every, everyday activities that ethics officials engage in to prevent violations I think, we think, are part of that enforcement scheme. What's also important is the cast of characters that are a, a, in an agency that deal with conduct type issues. And, and in those and in those jobs, also impact and affect ethics enforcement. Um, human resources is one of the most important offices because they are involved in a lot of, of activities that touch on people in, in their employment in particular. So when new employees are coming in, they're looking at determinations as to whether these are these are 450 filers, for example, and record keeping activities with regard to those filers. Um, when people come in and out who may be public financial disclosure filers, that information needs to be taken from the, ethic, the HR office and transmitted to the, the ethics office. Uh, they're making sure that new, new arrivals um, are getting the appropriate um, training on ethics that they're supposed to get. And they're also going to be involved in setting policies that might touch on ethics. And one of the most important of those, I think, recently we're seeing a lot of personal use of government computer activity. And obviously that's something that's covered in the um, standards of conduct, but it's also something that agencies deal with, uh, you know, uh, making bits of carve outs in, in the, what the standards prescribe. So these are things that um, a human resources office would be involved in. And also, uh, even more importantly, human resources officers um, and offices are involved in disciplinary action cases. Those, that's one of their bread and butter things. So they're going to be uh, somebody who may be coming to you as an ethics official with uh, a question perhaps about um, you know, what does a, a standard of conduct cover, what does it mean, and can we get advice and guidance in looking at a disciplinary action. Another um, cast of character that's important is the labor relations folks. I know some of you out there work at agencies that have collective bargaining agreements, that have unions, um, and obviously those employees uh, who are in unions may still have, well, so will still often have, well, they will, they do have, I should say, um, obligations under the standards of conduct. So there may be the same types of questions that come up with, with HR officials, but certainly come up with labor relations officials um, dealing with um, employee, employment issues. And a lot of times we have issues about, you know, whether, for example, uh, collective bargaining agreement trumps the standards of conduct, they don't. Um, whether certain activities that may be union related are, you know, that would be implicating the standards of conduct. So those types of questions do come up with some frequency. The Office of General Counsel 
Um, obviously, some agencies have their, um, their, their ethics and their HR functions housed in, under the general counsel umbrella. So in those offices, there may be more of a comfortable and a relationship with um, the ethics uh, group. So, there, so there's not a lot. You don't have to walk too far to get advice and counsel. But, um, but there's certainly going to be people who are involved in handling and um, EEO, excuse me, um, MSPB cases that are taken forward on ethics violations. So certainly, even if you don't have that relationship with ethics and HR, for example, being under the same umbrella, um, if you're in a, in a situation where there's disciplinary action being taken, the general counsel's office will certainly be involved. And finally, one of the other offices that's certainly implicated is the Office of Inspector General. Um, that, that's the group that's going to be involved with often investigating um, allegations of violations of conflict of interest uh, statutes. But in some agencies, they also will look at administrative charges. So if you're in one of those agencies, that would be the place where uh, an allegation of um, violation of a standard of conduct, for example, might be taken, might be looked at, and um, that it, they would be not only making facts, fa factual findings, but also making perhaps recommendations as to um, significant uh, recommended actions that could be taken based on the facts. And that would be presented to um, you know, the, the manager who would be in charge, uh, who would be really charged with deciding whether to pursue an action. So our first enforcement essential is, um, is that you need to establish relationships as an ethics official with all of these offices that also deal with conduct issue. Um, you know, we think that it's very important because everybody, all these agency offices have roles in helping to enforce ethics rules and regulations and the ethics official also has information and expertise that those offices need. So it's very valuable uh, to have relationships, to know how to have points of contact in all those offices that we just talked about. We want to have information sharing and we want to have consistency. So those are, those are, that's the result of having those collaborations. So we certainly uh, uh, encourage that kind of um, involvement. Now another, our next enforcement essential is uh, ethics enforcement may also lead to disciplinary actions. And that's, what, that's kind of the point of our, of our discussion today is to go through some of what happens when um, an ethics rule um, or, or law is violated and there is a follow-up action taken. Uh, certainly, um, you know, we think that um, this information is important to know about even if you're never faced with such a thing. Uh, and if you are faced with a, a disciplinary action and someone comes and asks you, you'll have a little bit of an overview about how the process works and what your role as an ethics official might be. Um, I think it's kind of interesting to look at some of the information that we gather uh, before we kind of get off on the, on the more the specifics of this topic. And as you know, as ethics officials, we, uh, we uh, ab every year ask you through the annual ethics, um, agency ethics program questionnaire for data about certain things. And one of them is disciplinary actions that are taken in agencies. So I thought it might be interesting to show you some of this information. Um, and the question that's asked is uh, for the first question, which is um, uh, related to conflicts of interest, the number of disciplinary actions based in whole or in part on violations of conflict of interest laws. And you see there that we have uh, you know, actions in the tens uh, f going from 2011 to 2014 with a pretty significant drop in 2014 as reported by agencies. And then the second column to the right we have um, uh, answers to questions, which is the number of disciplinary actions taken based in whole or in part on violations of the standards of conduct. And we see there that we have many more. We have thousands of actions that are reported, and that number has, has remained over 2,000 in the last four years that, you know, that we've been collecting this information. So that, that sort of brings us to the purpose of why we're focusing on standard of conduct and disciplinary actions today, because uh, this is an issue that perhaps we haven't really uh, spent as much time on as we have, for example, dealing with criminal violations and and, and relationships with IGs. So, but, but obviously there's a lot of activity here, so we want to make sure that, that you are aware of the processes. And also, um, we also want to focus on the fact that even though it's just an administrative violation as opposed to a criminal violation, people still can be disciplined significantly. For example, you know, the, the questionnaire we're asking for information about removals, demotions, suspensions, and written reprimands. So those are all pretty significant actions, especially removals, demotions, and suspensions. 
And as if a case can only get to the Merit Systems Protection Board if it involves a removal or demotion or suspension of 15 days or more. So you see that not only do we have numerosity, but we also have cases that are coming to the MSPB which involve pretty significant actions. And another, uh, just a, before we move on to the next page of stats, uh, interesting again, I think to note that um, conflict of interest referrals, um, you know, again have dropped uh, over the past uh, few years. Um, and this is again agency from the information from the agency ethics program questionnaire. Um, and you know, again, I think it, it just shows that criminal things are not perhaps not happening with the same frequency, and that's a good thing. That means we're doing our jobs in preventing. Um, but uh, we still have a fairly high level of administrative and, com and um, uh, standard of conduct things that we're dealing with. So I thought that was an interesting stat to share with you. Now I want to spend a little bit of time just kind of taking us through an overview of the administrative disciplinary process. And it really starts uh, with an allegation of misconduct. And this can come from many sources. It can come from employee supervisor or another employee. It could be an ethics official. It could be an inspector general um, you know, who, who's uh, received a hotline call or something of that nature. So it really could come from anywhere. And once an allegation uh, is received, um, it would be referred to be investigated. And that can be investigated by many different sources. As I mentioned earlier, some uh, agencies have inspector generals whose offices look at administrative allegations as well as criminal. So they might uh, take a stab at it in that case. Um, and if, the, if an agency doesn't have that sort of, um, th that wider range in their IG, um, then the HR office, human resources office, could be involved in investigating an ethics violation. And once an investigation is complete, um, the, the information is referred to someone uh, to review, usually the employee supervisor, in consultation with the general counsel's office or the human resources office to decide um, what the evidence reflects and whether there is sufficient uh, information there to support some kind of a misconduct or disciplinary charge. Um, this is also, this is an important phase of the process because if a decision is made to take an action, you're going to be looking at what kind of thing is supported by the actual evidence. And that's important because, as we'll see later, the agency has the requirement to prove by preponderance of the evidence the, the charges that it makes. So, you know, when you're looking at, when you're trying to decide whether we should go forward with something, for example, um, the agency really needs to focus on whether it has agency to support such a charge. Now, once a charge is selected, uh, the agency will have to decide what kind of penalty to propose. Um, and this is done through consideration of lots of different factors. Um, there are specifically uh, 12, what they call 12 Douglas factors that are looked at. And those are factors that were developed by the Merit Systems Protection Board in a case that was litigated um, in the 1980s. And some of those things are such a, things like the nature and seriousness of the offense, whether the employee was on notice of a certain other type of dis um, infraction uh, that they engaged in, was um, something that could be disciplined for, whether they've had training, what kind of performance they have, and all these factors are weighed and balanced to either aggravate the penalty or mitigate the penalty. And one other thing that may, may be considered in the penalty phase of, of deciding what to propose is whether an agency has a table of penalties. And that is basically a, a matrix that lists on one side types of infractions, and it could be very specific or very general, and, also, and then recommended penalties that go along with um, the, an infraction. And it's generally taken from the agency's history and practice with regard to certain types of, of charges. Some agencies do have very specific charges, including ethics charges. Um, however, um, I think they're, you know, I would say generally that they're kind of out of vogue because they're viewed as limiting agencies somewhat, is if you have a table of penalties, you really have to stick to it. Um, and also, sometimes it's not very helpful if they say, if you um, have this infraction and you have, you know, either the first time or the tenth time you've done it, the range of penalties is from uh, a, a um, suspension to removal, that doesn't really say much. So it's not really that useful in, as a guide for people. Now, um, in, in moving on, the next issue is uh, issuing the discipline to the employee. And that's done by a proposing official. And the, what, what the employee will get 
is a letter, and this is in, in issues that would be going to the MSPB involving suspensions of 15 days or more, demotions or removals. They're going to get a proposed uh, dis notice of discipline which would state the charges and the evidence that's being uh, described as supporting the charges and also the basis for the penalty. And they would get as well uh, the documentation that the agency is relying on to support the charge. And once the agency, uh, the employee gets that, due process uh, rights kick in and the employee has the right to, um, to notice an opportunity to to respond. So the notice part is fulfilled by the employee getting the letter and the evidence relied on, either with the letter or else they can subsequently go and see it or ask for it. And also they get a chance to respond verbally and if they wish to, also in writing and before the deciding official. So they have a chance to sort of make their case, if you will. Employee is also in, in, entitled to representation in this process. And once the deciding official gets all this information, has the proposal, has the agency's, the, excuse me, the employee's response, then the uh, deciding official will make a decision and inform the employee uh, in writing of the decision and the consequences thereof. Diana, can I interrupt you one second and ask a question? I mm -hmm. know you're going to go on to talk specifically about ethics official involvement, but with respect to um, the, the process itself, the administrative process, um, when it comes to <clears throat> investigating, typically I think ethics officials wouldn't necessarily have a role in the investigative process. That would be other officials who would engage in that, correct? Well, yeah, I would say that they're not going to be investigating. Right. That's not their role. But they may be consulted by an ethics official, by, excuse me, by an investigator if they have information that's relevant to the investigation. And in terms of who, when you spoke a couple of times about a decision being made whether or what charge to to, to present, who typically are those deciding officials? Who, who in the organization decides whether or not those will move forward? Well, I think there, there are obviously <coughs> the uh, manager who's proposing is going to be involved in that, and that's usually the direct line supervisor. And then uh, it may be also in consultation with general counsel's office, with HR. And certainly, I would think that if there's an ethics issue there, that they that the person might consult with uh, an ethics official to make sure they're on solid ground. Okay. Um, again, going on to ethics official involvement in this process, um, there are lots of par parts of the process where an ethics official might be involved. Um, for maybe somebody who actually brings a, an allegation forward to be investigated. Uh, it might be somebody who's, you might be consulted for ex ethics expertise on a particular charge. For example, if the agency is considering bringing a particular charge against an employee, they might come and say, we're not really sure what this means, what this regulation covers, can you explain to us what kind of conduct um, is covered by this. You may be asked to provide specific information regarding um, the allegation. For example, you may be asked whether there was training or advice given on a particular issue that's involved. And obviously, that may be very important to whether or not uh, an agency can go forward with a particular um, issue. You may be asked for documentation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later on in the, in the presentation today about documentation, but what I would say about that is that obviously it can be very important if it shows that advice was given and the person consulted, gave a, a pretty good, uh, complete um, statement of the facts involved and got advice from an ethics official. That may, again, have an impact on whether or not discipline can go forward. So certainly uh, an ethics official may be asked about that. And finally, there's a possibility that uh, an ethics official might be asked to testify at a proceeding um, involving an employee if, if they have information that's relevant to the charges, for example, about advice that was given. We'll see that comes up later on in one of the cases we're going to talk about later today. Or if there's documentation that needs to be authenticated by the author, in, in which case if the ethics official wrote it, they would be the person that would need to authenticate it. And I told you we were going to talk about documentation, so here's, here's my, my um, plug for it. Um, documentation pros, it creates a record of an event. As I noted, especially it can document something like uh, counseling or advice that's sought by uh, an employee and advice that's given. It can help to refresh a memory of an event if there's a subsequent need to testify about the event or provide information to somebody who's investigating and can serve as evidence in a subsequent proceeding like an MSPB case. 
Um, now, OGE does actually have uh, a legal advisory that covers situations where it's advisable to give documentation, and that uh, legal advisory is DO-05-19, Documenting Ethics Advice, and it is on our website and available to be read. Uh, for, and I advise you, I, I think you should read it. It's very important. It gives some great parameters, which I will go over a few of today. Because obviously, OGE recognizes that it's not practicable uh, especially if you're in a small office where you have a lot of uh, activity to document every single thing that happens in, in every single piece of advice that you give. But certainly there may be situations where that it's more important to do that. And some of those ones that uh, OG has identified in the legal advisory are as follows. Advice regarding senior officials. Generally, the more senior the official, the more important it is to create a written documentation of ethics advice. Advice regarding employees involved in procurement. And that's particularly true when you have a situation where the advice relates to seeking employment with a contractor or post-employment issues involving working for a contractor. Advice on sensitive matters, because these are more likely to be scrutinized um, outside, both inside and outside of government. Certainly applying the criminal statute to specific facts um, and, uh, and dealing with complicated ethics issues. So, I mean, these are things that um, instances where OGE recommends the documentation be made. And also, um, there's, a, at the end of the legal advisory, some tips on what to include, and we recommend that you include an indication of when the advice was given, a summary of the relevant facts as described by the employee, a citation of the ac applicable legal authority, and analysis describing how the law applies to the facts, and a conclusion. So that's, uh, you know, our, our OGE's view on situations where it's good to have documentation, and certainly, I think, if you talk to an IG or an HR official, they're going to tell you that there are certain times when documentation is critical to a case um, involving any kind of infraction, conduct infraction. I want to talk a little bit uh, about an overview of the MSPB appeal process. Um, some of you may not be familiar with that. If you're lawyers, bear with me. If you deal with these sorts of issues and have had cases in the past, um, we'll be getting to actual cases pretty soon. Um, now, the MSPB appeal process starts with an appeal being filed by an employee. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the MSPB has limited jurisdiction over the types of cases that can hear. And with regard to disciplinary action cases, it's got to be a suspension of 15 days or more, a demotion, or a removal from federal service. So as if it's not one of those things and doesn't fit into any other parameters for MSPB jurisdiction, it doesn't, it's not going to be reviewed by, by the board. And we actually have a case where that's what happened to somebody who brought an issue that was a standard of conduct issue, yet they were not able to be heard. Um, now, the employee is the generally, um, almost exclusively in, um, in disciplinary action cases, um, the one who files um, the appeal at the MSPB. So they have a limited time period after getting the, serving the discipline to, to file an appeal. They file that either usually electronically now. Um, my, when I started out, it was all paper, but now we have to put every, scan everything in and send it electronically, which is much more um, uh, convenient and also saves resources. But, um, and once that's filed, then the MSPB will appoint an administrative judge to preside over the case. Uh, the administrative judge's job is to marshal facts, have a hearing, and issue a decision, but they also kind of help in developing evidence. So they will, uh, the judge will provide a time frame uh, and parameters for the parties to engage in discovery. So that, that means that the parties will be, be able to ask each other questions, written questions called interrogatories. They'll be able to request in writing documents, and those are document requests in legal parlance, and also um, have people, uh, witnesses who are relevant and have information that's relevant to the case. And that's a very kind of general, um, very broad sense what relevant means, but they'll be able to have those people come in and testify under oath in the process of gathering information. Can I stop you one second? I sure. think we have a question on the Google Hangout. Is it relevant to what? Uh, actually, it's uh, going back a couple of slides. Okay. And, okay. Uh, someone asks if there's an investigation of alleged misconduct, uh, are there any requirements for reporting when they find out that there has been no violation of the ethics conflict of interest laws or standards of conduct? Well, that's an interesting question, um, and I think, um, you know, generally there, there are always the privacy concerns there. So if an employee is being investigated, 
um, you know, the employee might be told when the investigation is completed and what was found. Uh, and the manager who would be, who's in charge of that employee might be told or would be told. But that's probably going to be it. So, for example, if somebody made an allegation against an employee, they may, might not be told what the results of the investigation is. But I would certainly also say that, you know, if we have an ethics office um, that's involved in an investigation, um, they ought to be advised that the investigation is concluded. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we, we encourage um, ethics officials to have points of contact in all of those, you know, offices where those, those important players are located. So if you have a question or concern about the status of an investigation, you can check on it, you know, because if you've been involved in it, you, you know, you have a right to know. The, you know, the uh, employees at large don't, but if you've been involved in it as in part of your job duties, yes, you should be told, um, and, and you have a right certainly to inquire about the status of it. Excellent. And there's no requirement, or is there a requirement to uh, alert OGE when there has been an investigation of a potential standards violation but uh, no finding of wrongdoing? I don't believe that there is, no. no. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we're just continuing on with the MSPB appeal process. After um, we've had discovery completed, the judge, as I said, will, will convene a hearing to have the parties uh, provide evidence and testimony, both uh, you know, verbal and documentary, to support, support their, their various positions. The administrative judge will issue a decision. And those decisions are actually available online through services like Westlaw and Lexis. Um, from that point forward, um, if either party is unhappy with the administrative judge's decision, they can request that the full board, which is a three-member panel uh, of, of individuals appointed for terms, um, uh, to review the decision. And that's based basically on the hearing record itself. They're very, very infrequently the board will have oral argument on, on issues of particular significance where they want um, agency and, other, and others' views. But generally speaking, we're looking at what's been developed in the record before the administrative judge, plus arguments that the um, parties choose to submit to uh, put forth their positions. Um, and again, the board will issue a um, written decision which is published. Those are published actually in, in, in a reporter called the MSPB Reporter. And they're also available on online services like Lexis and Westlaw. And then there is a further level of review um, at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And that's a very limited uh, court, a very limited jurisdiction that's located here in Washington, D.C. All MSPB cases have to go there, and that's, um, that's different from any other sort of case. If you're in district court you know, in, in D.C., uh, you file your appeal with, um, with the, the court that's, you know, the, the Court of Appeals for, for D.C., but, you know, if you put a different place, you, and you, you can file your appeal based on where you're located geographically. But for the MSPB cases, no matter where they occur, you're, if you want to go to court to have a federal circuit review it, you have to file it with the court here in Washington, D.C. The other thing that's very interesting about this court is that the process is, 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 is limited um, um, in, in terms of who can go. If you're an employee who's been subjected to a disciplinary action and you disagree with the MSPB's decision, you can go forward assuming you've met jurisdictional requirements. Um, and, but, an, but an agency has to go through certain processes to get permission, if you will, to go forward to, um, to um, the Federal Circuit to have a decision looked at. And so there's a, that process is spelled out in the MSPB's regulations. Now, in an MSPB appeal um, for disciplinary cases, the agency has the burden of proving charges by preponderance of the evidence, the reasonableness of the penalty, and those think factors all together talk, talk, constitute whether the agency's proved that the action is supported by, supports the efficiency of the service. So that's kind of the concept um, that makes up the efficiency of the service standard. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the role of, the, uh, of an ethics official at the MSPB. Um, they may provide information requested in discovery, documents or testimony. They may provide written documents that are exhibits um, that may not have been produced in discovery but may be needed for, uh, if they weren't asked for, uh, I should say, if they may be needed for, to prove points of the agency's making its case. And there's also, depending on the case, the possibility that an, that an ethics official could be a witness at an MSPB hearing. We have another question that's come in through the Hangout. Sure. Uh, and that is, you know, have you ever run into a situation where the ethics official might also be the employee relations uh, person for the agency? Uh, and do you have any advice for navigating any potential conflicts there? 
I don't have any experience with that, um, but um, you know, I think I'm not really sure that there would be conflicts because um, you know, when when you're in that ethics role, it's kind of a role with ten, a little bit of tension. You know, um, you do you are providing advice and guidance to employees, but uh, you do have uh, your, you know in the back of your obligation, you know, underlying obligation is an obligation to the agency to make sure that um, if there is wrongdoing that it's reported and dealt with. So you know I think it's a very difficult role I think for a person to be in and certainly lawyers who also serve as ethics officials and, and maybe HR counsel have that same concern. But I think, uh, and I think it's a, a real concern for people. Uh, but you know, I think what we would say is that you, know, you have to be mindful of that tension and there may be a point in time if you're talking to someone about an issue that you have to stop them and re stop and remind them of your role, who you are, who you serve, and so that they don't step over it and implicate themselves not understanding who you serve. So. Excellent. Thanks very much. Sure. <clears throat> now, why is it important? Um, again, just to sum up the ethics officials' involvement in ethics enforcement, uh, it's important because they have varying roles that can be important to um, you know, activities and in the, in the agency's uh, viability if they choose to go forward with a disciplinary action case. An ethics official's guide expertise can determine on the merits what constitutes an ethics violation in consultation with HR or, or general counsel's office. An ethics official may be providing information and evidence regarding a charge, including whether the employee sought advice and was counseled about a particular issue that may be, is being considered to be brought as a charge. And the ethics official can also provide information regarding training that can either mitigate or aggravate a penalty. And we'll see in some cases that uh, an MSPB judge looked at whether or not an employee got training um, in several cases and decided that that was something that, that uh, really supported the penalty against them because the person should have known better. Now I want to talk about some cases. Uh, this is what you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I just remind you that I'm going to, I know I'll be going through these in summary fashion and I don't have all the full sites here. However, um, we will be giving you a handout after the session that includes all the cases that we're talking about today, as well as some other cases that we're not really talking about, but it may be of interest to you. So, so you don't need to write down everything <laughs> that I'm <laughs> saying, <laughs> and we are going to give that to you. It's either going to be with your um, request for an evaluation or shortly thereafter. So and when you get that email, definitely open it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the first case I want to talk about is Mueller versus Department of Justice. And this case really, the, the, the issue that was there was the basic obligation of public service under uh, 5 CFR 2635-101-B14. Uh, uh, so it's a very general regulation, and it's, it's interesting why, they, why the agency chose to do this. Of course, we don't always know why, you know, basically looking at cases of why an agency chose to proceed as they did. But that's the regulation, that issue. And also interesting, of interest in this case is that it resolves whether ethics advice gi is given when there's no documentation of same. Um, now, if you're familiar with the ethics regulations, you know that uh, B14 is one of the state principles of ethical conduct, you know, um, so we call it in shorthand the 14 principles, and it basically says that an employee shall endeavor to avoid actions that, uh, that um, give the appearance that they're violating the law or ethical standards set forth in this part, to which you're referring part 2635 of 5 U.S. Code. And also, it requires an evaluation of a situation uh, based on the perspective of a reasonable person with knowledge of the relevant facts. So in this case, we have uh, a situation who has a supervisor who was um, in the, at the FBI who's involved in um, contracting for some services for his work unit. And um, in, in the process of, of doing that, um, a, co a company um, that was the Battelle Memorial Foundation was one of the applicants for the contract, you know, um, bid on the contract, and was one of the, one of the con companies considered for the contract. But it just so happens that this particular company, um, the, uh, the employees had a brother who worked there and also a good friend who worked there. So here we have an issue, obviously, of appearance, right? So, um, but what, what's the first thing that, that we have, the first dispute that we have is um, what did he do when he found this out? The employee says that he went and talked to his supervisors and the FBI Office of General Counsel to get clearance to, to continue working on this case, on this matter. 
So, but there was no documentation of that. The, uh, they, they went back and looked and talked to the general counsel's office and talked to the supervisors. They, none of them remembered anything about this and there was no documentation. So what the judge did was the judge said, well, there's no evidence of this other than the, empl the employee's testimony. The employee has the burden of proving this happened, so I'm going to find that it didn't happen. So, you know, and obviously if there had been documentation of this, that would be dispositive. Here we just kind of lucked out that the judge, um, you know, believed the supervisors and, and, the, uh, and not the employee. But that, but that could have been a problem for the, employee, for the agency in this case, but it wasn't because it was dispelled by the judge's uh, ruling on the facts. Now, um, you know, the, now the, although the employee said that he was told it was okay to proceed, he also said, interestingly, that he recused from the selection process. But he actually didn't recuse from the selection process. He actually um, he, he selected some of his own subordinates to be involved in the process. So they served as members of the selection panel who were responsible for reviewing the bids and making decisions of the final contractor selection. And according to the employee, these people all knew that his brother and friend worked at this at Patel, which is one of the select one of the companies that was in the group and was actually finally selected by this panel. So uh, the appellant was was uh, proposed with discipline and ended up with this case under review at the MSPB. And the judge was looking at uh, again looking at the case under 2635 101B14 and noticed that to establish the existence of an appearance of preferential treatment, the agency had to show that the employee's interest or duties in one capacity, capacity would, reasonably, um, would reasonably create an appearance of having an effect on interest or duties, or duties, work duties, when viewed from the perspective of a reasonable person. So uh, the first argument that the appellant made, the, the employee made, was that who is the reasonable person that should be, that should, whose, whose views should be considered? And he thought it should be the everybody in the agency who was aware that his brother and friend worked at this company yet didn't seem to have a problem with it. And the judge said, no, uh, that's not a reasonable person. A reasonable person is not somebody who's actually involved in the particular occurrence. A reasonable person is someone who um, is a disinterested person who's familiar with the facts at issue. So, so the uh, employee's argument about who should who the reasonable person is was struck down and really looking at much more of an objective person standard versus somebody who knows and is involved in the particular transaction. And then the judge went on to continue his analysis by finding that um, you know a reasonable person uh, so defined um, who was aware of the appellant's involvement and in choosing the contractor here could find that his his actions uh, gave the appearance of preferential treatment and whether preferential treatment was actually uh, actually occurred is not relevant it's all about the appearance so therefore uh, this gentleman was uh, his a the suspension of uh, the uh, disciplinary action was sustained and he um, was to receive a suspension the next case I want to talk about is... Uh, Can I stop you for just one sure. second, Diana? Because mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things to note in that case is is what they pointed to in the standards for the charge, which was they didn't go to the more specifically articulated standard in the impartiality provisions in subpart E. They went with the more conceptual piece, which was in the, for, which was in the principles, which was in 101. Mm -hmm. Do you have a thought? any thoughts on that? Well, I suspect that um, they may not have gone that route because of this question about whether the employee got advice. Mm -hmm. Because he's saying that he went and, and talked to someone, when that's his obligation. If something comes to mind, you go and get permission. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you have that discussion and, and get clearance to proceed. And if he had gotten clearance to proceed, that would have caused, that would, certainly would have been taken a chunk out of the agency's strength of their case. And we get see you see that I think that's probably why that was done that way. Well, if they, if they would have brought the charges under the the, the very specific articulated stuff in, in subpart E, which has a definition of covered relationship right, and has definition, right. would that have created an extra burden for the agency to have had to establish all of those elements? Probably yes, yes, because here we're just looking at whether a reasonable person looking at the situation would think there's impart there's you know, would, could believe there's something, uh, there was impartiality. Mm -hmm. We don't even have to show it occurred. Right. What did somebody think of this? And we're saying, yes, someone could look at this and think there was, there was impartiality. Um, and whether or not it actually occurred is irrelevant. So right. I think it gave the agency a little bit of an easier time. Um, and, you know, but, but the corresponding to that is that, you, that, you know, if they had tried to fire this gentleman, for example, they probably would not have been able to do that. If, you know, if they had uh, 502, they might have been able to. 
Gotcha. Okay, moving on to Henny versus Department of Defense. This is a case involving um, a gift from a prohibited source uh, under 2635-202. And this gentleman um, was, uh, he worked as a supervisory financial management specialist uh, at, with the Air Force and was involved in working with um, uh, credit unions and putting, um, uh, setting up ATMs on, on a base. And he got to be kind of chummy with a particular um, credit union and um, they they said to him that they would be willing to pay for him to attend a um, a, count, a, a, a council, um, sort of a conference, I guess, given by the Defense Credit Union Council. And subsequently, um, there, a letter was received that's from the Defense Credit Union Council indicating that this gentleman's um, registration had been paid and he was confused about whether it was this, this particular um, credit union or whether it was the sponsor, who, which was Defense Credit Union Council, that was covering the event. Um, and the registration fee was $700, a little bit more than $700, so it's significant, okay? So uh, this gentleman unfortunately did not resolve this issue of who it was who was covering his uh, expenses and went to the conference. Uh, then later on, for some reason, which is not clear in the decision, um, became concerned about it, um, got ethics advice, and was told it was a prohibited gift, paid the money back, and um, but nevertheless was facing discipline. And I don't think we, we really don't have any dispute about what happened, other than uh, a question about well, you know, it wasn't clear to me. Um, I did go at some point and get guidance and advice about what to do, and I did pay the money back, so no harm, no foul. But um, the judge dis disagreed with that and said, and what was very material in finding against the employee was that this gentleman had had repeated instances of training and therefore was charged with knowing that, um, you know, what, what, what constituted a prohibited gift, especially from an outside source or prohibited source, and therefore that this person, if he was confused, about the source of the gift and the significance of the, of the source of the gift, uh, the gift being this um, payment for this, um, this, this uh, conference uh, attendance, he should have gone to his ethics official and cleared it up before he accepted it. And the fact that he didn't do that because he had training um, really convinced the judge that that was the charge to be sustained and that discipline, which was a demotion in this case, I believe, um, excuse me, should be sustained. So, so I think here we show, um, you see, a, a um, you know, the regulations in action on gifts from a prohibited source. And we also see that, um, that the effects of, of training that an employee receives um, on, on these issues can be considered in determining whether to sustain the actual, not only the penalty, but also the merits of the charge. <clears throat> the next case I want to talk about is um, O'Leary versus Department of Energy. And this is a case that, uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, is a jurisdictional case. And so and the reason why it's important is because it's talking about someone's displeasure at being told they have to recuse from certain job duties under 2635. On this particular instance, this employee was a, a high-level employee at, um, in the Department of Energy at the Los Alamos field office, and his wife was elected to a, p a position, a political position, as a Lo Los, Los Alamos County Council member. The agency determined that uh, the Los Alamos County had an interest in the security contract and other issues that touched on uh, work that the uh, employee did as part of his job. And so the, obviously the agency being concerned about the appearance of impropriety um, in the performance of his duties issued him a letter requiring him to recuse from certain activities and also restricting some other duties that he performed. So uh, this gentleman uh, took umbrage at that um, and filed an appeal at the MSPB saying that he thought it was, uh, um, that it was unfair and wrong to do this. Number one, there was also a prohibited personnel practice for the agency to require him to recuse from activities because of his wife's position and uh, or to be, have his job duties altered because of that. The MSPB said that, well, you know, we have very limited jurisdiction um, and you know, really looking at uh, you know, demotions, removals, uh, things that involve diminution of pay, such as uh, demotions, removals, and significant suspensions, and merely having your job duties uh, affected because of an ethics regulation does not give us jurisdiction. So unfortunately, we can't, we're not going to be able to look at this. So I think this is important because, you know, I'm sure that many ethics officials face 
employees who are concerned or unhappy, displeased that they may have to be put in this position um, by virtue of a relationship or um, you know with, with a family member or another covered relationship, have job duties changed or altered, and they think that looks bad, it makes me look bad, etc. I'm an honest person. Why you're doing this? But obviously, the agency has an interest. Um, they have to go forward and the MSPB will not step in even though they may disagree. <clears throat> the next cases I think that are important, um, just kind of again to touch on some of those issues I talked about earlier involving uh, places where we really have uh, an intersection, if you will, with HR and um, ethics offices. So these all involve situations where we have misuse of position under subpart G, use of government property. On this first case, my vet versus court services and supervision, we have involves a misuse of a fax machine, um, and this gentleman who who wor worked in a who was really involved with dealing with sensitive information from individuals, um, uh, decided for some reason to fax to his home some sensitive information from you know, an employee um, at, that with whom he's whose records he's dealt he dealt with at his job. So um, and it, it, it was um, decided that uh, he admitted that he did it and said he, he gave a reason for why he did it, but obviously it was not deemed plausible or acceptable. And uh, the agency, the judge said, well, you know, you were aware from training that this, your actions uh, constituted a violation of, of the standard of conduct under particularly 2635-704. And you also knew that you were handling particularly sensitive information that um, you know you not be, should not be shared or 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 you know sent to other places. It's particularly not your home. So that so even so that you're misusing government equipment when you took that action of, of faxing sensitive information. Um, and the other two cases that we have are Chauvet versus HUD and Smith versus Department of Energy. Both involve situations involving misuse of government computer. I mean, and obviously this is something that, uh, since we've started having computers in our offices, has generated a lot of issues and controversy. Uh, and the thing I think is important about these cases, um, first of all, both both had serious disciplinary actions sustained. Um, Chauvet was fired and Smith was suspended. Um, you know, in, in, in they're both for significant um, misuse of the of the computer. Um, one employee was um, removed from his position for um, downloading pornographic websites, um, using it to uh, run an outside business, and also just just being on the computer and a lot of time not doing work that uh, was related to his government job duties. And Smith um, was suspended because was because of her ex extensive use of the computer in a personal and inappropriate way. She sent personal emails from her government computers. I think the decision says something like 4,000 personal emails. Um, so the agency cited in that case its limited personal use policy, um, which says that. Um, you know, you're allowed to use it for certain things, but even though we have this personal use policy, it does not completely abrogate the standards of conduct that say that um, you, know, you still have a responsibility to not misuse government, government equipment for unauthorized purposes. So I think what these, these body of cases, these two cases really teach us is that um, you need to you know, be aware of kind of where these two policies intersect because obviously the standards of conduct say no, no, you can't do anything unauthorized, but the agency has the right to go in and define what is authorized. So when you're looking at these cases, you always have to read into the facts, um, you know, read into the situation you're dealing with, you know, what, what, is, there, is there a rule regarding personal use and what does it say? Because we start from a, a, a foundation of no, you can't do anything, and we carve out a little bit. But but the other thing, correspondingly, it's important is, is noticed in the Smith case in particular that even though you have a personal use policy, it doesn't tr it doesn't trump um, and invalidate the, the, the standards of conduct regulations that say you, you have to you know not misuse government equipment. So I think those cases are worth noting for that reason. The next case is, um, I think, another misuse uh, case, but involves misuse of position under subpart G of 2635. And this case, um, I think, is important, significant for a lot of reasons. First of all, it involves a senior executive. 
uh, who was removed from her position. So, you know, if, if you think that standard of conduct charges can't uh, topple the mighty, they can. In this case, this person was the director of the Department of Defense Education Activity at, uh, at DDO, at, at the Department of Defense, and so she had a very significant position. And she was charged with using her position to, to promote the employment of, and by direct extension, uh, the financial interest of her son's fiance. And uh, what she did was that she sent repeated emails and otherwise made inquiries of the human resources director and other employees about, um, about her, her son's fiance's interest in getting a teaching position um, in, under the Defense Department of Defense Education Activity. And apparently she did this repeatedly in different formats. She called, she sent emails, she asked about vacancies, she asked about all kinds of things. Um, and she was even told not to do this anymore by the, by the Director of Human Resources. Um, and it got to the point where the people receiving these messages ceased paying any attention to them because they were so multiple, uh, happening in so many occasions. But um, eventually this person did get a job um, and, uh, and she also married the, the employee's son. Um, but in the meantime, the, the employee was charged with misconduct. Misuse of per position for private gain. Um, and the agency, the MSPB noted that in order to establish a charge, they had to show misuse by the appellant of her government position resulting in actual private gain. Um, and uh, using this analysis, the judge found that the appellant, um, who was the director of this, of this particular activity, um, wielded significant authority and power in her position and that uh, she really misused it. She, she knew that if she emailed somebody, at least in the beginning, um, people would look at it and they would be expected, to, they would feel coerced to do something. So she did uh, misuse her position. Um, so that hits one and two. Now the resulting private gain is another issue that was focused on because here we have a situation where we have somebody who is not necessarily quite fit all the parameters. Here's somebody who is um, um, not, uh, not, maybe not, I'm not sure if it's a friend, not, maybe not a relative yet, uh, and there's, there's no, nothing, no description of an, uh, an affiliation in another, um, another way uh, that would be covered by the regulations. But the judge said, well, you know, we're going to look at this and we're going to think that it's axiomatic that, um, you know, that prohibition of using public office for private gain includes private gain of others connected with the employee, not just the employee. So even though this person was kind of, you know, you know, interestingly situated for most of this time, we're going to find that it benefited the employee to have this person who was going to be marrying her son have a job and therefore her actions were um, a pri constituted private gain to her and so therefore the charge was sustained. So I think this is an interesting illustration of how the MSPB will look at some of these uh, requirements and the regulations and kind of look at the facts, give a, a, a very uh, sort of real world look, real world evaluation of them. And, uh, and come to a conclusion. And, and I think it's even more significant that the conclusion reached involved a really senior employee at an agency, um, you know, based on in finding that their conduct, her conduct was improper and in sustaining a removal action against her. The last couple of cases I think are um, important for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I have them, this case Newton versus Department of the Army, um, is, is a case that involves several uh, allegations of ethics infractions, including um, significantly one of 502, which we don't see very often. Um, and, but, the, but the interesting thing about this case is that um, the judge looking at all the facts and evidence found not only that um, all, nearly all of the charges were not supported and sustainable, but he also found that the agency um, retaliated against this, uh, this employee for whistleblowing. So it kind of shows the kind of how a case can work out when you're looking at multiple issues uh, in terms of regulation violations and also you know, being mindful of other laws that impact uh, a disciplinary action case such as whistleblower reprisal. In this particular case, Ms. Newton was uh, demoted based on charges that arose based more or less from a forensic um, in investigation of information taken from her computer. And um, the supervisor who ordered this investigation did so about two weeks after she made 
protected disclosures to him about uh, concerns she had about hiring practices in the agency. So that's kind of the whistleblower piece. But just in terms of um, going through some of the issues that they were looking at, um, I will tell you as follows. She was charged with misusing her government computer, excessive personal use. Um, it was alleged that she um, used her computer and, and had to, to surf sites, about uh, over 100 sites. Um, the, the judge took issue with um, the way that the agency had decided that she was actually on these sites, and the, the employer herself admitted that she did look at some of the sites, but she did not agree that she looked at as many as the agency found, nor did she stay on them as long as they said. So that actually was the only charge that was sort of sustained by the judge because more or less the employee admitted it. Um, she was also charged with the use of a government computer and office in furtherance of an outside business. Um, because the appellant, or the employee was um, accepting tax information from other employees in the workplace, and she was providing free services of doing tax returns and giving tax advice. So I know when we're looking at that, going, what? You know, that's another issue. <laughs> so, but there's a whole other, other issue maybe implicated there. Those were not looked at. It was clearly look, just looked at. Was she in furthering an outside business by doing this? And the judge found well. Um, she was not getting paid by anybody, so it's not a business there, per se. And while she did work at H&R Block, there was no evidence that any of her activities um, in accepting information from employees at the workplace on her work computer um, constituted a furtherance of an, out, you know, of an outside business, because there's nothing that showed that she was doing stuff with H&R Block on her computer. Um, now, she's also charged with vo violating a joint ethics regulation by using her government computer in furtherance of the affairs of a private organization. Um, but here, uh, the judge found that it clearly fell within one of the exceptions to the JAR because this was a nonprofit, and therefore, on its face, the regulation that they were citing said, you know, you can do this with a nonprofit. So, so there, you know, that's just some, a fault, so an issue of, of evidence. Somebody just kind of missed the boat on that one, I think. She was also charged with violating uh, 5 CFR 2635-1 because she maintained resumes of friends and families on her computer, which she contended she used, um, you know, she just maintained as a, as a favor for people. But the agency said that she used those to provide special treatment for friends and family but it didn't go on and talk about what, whether her actions ever actually resulted in participation or an attempt in any selection process or an attempt to influence any, any hiring process. So now, you know, and give you a little bit more meat on that, this, the employee admitted that she just kept these things in her computer and if somebody called up and said, wow, I really want to apply for this job, can you just forward it to me, forward it to the selecting official because, you know, I don't have a lot of time to get my application in and she would do it. Um, but uh, the agency didn't really claim that her actions involved participation or an attempt to influence, which would really be the meat of kind of, you know, and, and there was no indication that any of these selecting officials knew that she was sending these resumes or had any involvement at all or felt compelled to, to, you know, to um, look at the situation in, in any other way because of her involvement. There's no indication that she, uh, that anyone viewed her actions as improper on its face. You know, they only got this information for, through the forensic investigation. So uh, again, the judge said, no, we're not, don't, don't think there's a charge there. Now here are the ones that are really interesting to me because these are involving 502, 2635 502. Um, and by failing to identify a potential conflict of interest or recuse herself when a conflict or appearance are, existed. And so what the agency's charging her with was failing in her job to go to management and tell them when, when there was a potential for a conflict involving you know, her participation in some activity. And this uh, appellant was an auditor, so she was auditing programs. Um, in the two specific um, issues that she was, the factual issues that were raised was one involving uh, an employee who was alleged to have been a friend. And this employee uh, evidently um, was, was, was saying that she had not been getting proper uh, 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 payment, pay and salary increases. And so an audit was requested by uh, one another agency component and the appellant did it. But there's some um, suggestion that that this that um, the employee was friends with the person who was having her her work history audited. That they had um, she actually did tax information for her, I believe, but it was free. 
Um, and she also um, supposedly went on a cruise with her and did all these other things, um, but the appellant disputed that. Um, but basically, um, the, the um, judge found that there was no proof of a financial or business relationship, and because this person was not a member of the household of the employee, then there was not a covered relationship there that Im implicated 502. So, um, so there, th that charge was not sustained. The second one I think is a little closer. Um, this um, employee was charged with auditing a specific um, co-op program that the agency operated and she, her niece and her son both applied for positions in the co-op program and submitted um, resumes and the, the uh, employee was alleged to have um, helped in preparing and submitting these resumes. The son was actually hired for a position, he was a student, and he was hired for a co-op position, and subsequently this employee was involved with um, auditing the co-op program. So again, the agency said you know, that she should have gone to her supervisors and, and brought this up, but she did not, so therefore she's violated 502. Um, and the um, judge said, no, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I did not sustain that charge. There was no evidence that um, the employee was involved in the selection process for um, her, the son. There was no participation, therefore, in the selection process, and there was no indication that her actions in auditing this co-op um, were looking at anything that would have a financial impact on her son. She wasn't managing anything or, or dealing with the program, and therefore, she wasn't auditing him. She was auditing this co-op program. Therefore, um, there's no covered relationship and no 502 violation. So, you know, I think that uh, just those, the, the recitation of all of these um, ethics uh, questions is significant and uh, warrants a close reading of this case. Again, I think that the 502 issues, regardless of you know what you think about the judge's analysis, are rare. We don't see those a lot, a lot of times in cases. Uh, and I think that uh, this is a statute, this is a regulation that's hard to enforce. But um, this is a situation where somebody charged it and a judge looked at it. So I would urge you to, to read this decision. I think it's very um, illustrative. Um, now, what, whatever happened to this employee? What, well, what happened based on this case is that her demotion was not sustained for two reasons. The first reason, because um, as, as I went through this evidence with these allegations with you, the judge did not sustain any of the charges except the very first one, which she essentially admitted. So right there, the judge said, you know, I haven't got preponderance of the evidence. Um, but even more importantly, this employee raised uh, an affirmative defense of whistleblower reprisal and said that even it so um, said that notwithstanding the agency's charges and whether they're supported, I think that this was done to me because I, I blew the whistle on the agency. And, and normally what happens in these cases is that the, the individual is, has the burden of proving that they're a whistleblower. The judge said she met that burden. And then the agency has to show by clear and convincing evidence that it would have taken the same actions notwithstanding the whistleblowing. And the judge basically said, I've gone through this, these charges, there's no merit here, you can't prove by clear and convincing evidence, therefore, not only will the action not be sustained that, you know, you know um, it, it be based on the merits, it's also whistleblower reprisal, so you know, relief will be ordered. So I think this is an interesting case, again, how, how all these various statutes and things, you know, kind of coalesce here is also an interesting case because it talks about something we don't see much in, in these, these cases, five, the 502 issue. So it's very interesting and I urge you to read the decision. And I want to close out with a comparison of this case with another case that also involved a whistleblower, just to kind of show you what can happen when things, um, you know, when we have, you know, ethics official involvement and, it, and it's done well. Um, the last case um, is that I want to talk about uh, is the Sullivan versus Department of Transportation which involves termination of a gentleman who was determined to be a whistleblower um, even though um, based on, um, on information provided by the agency. In this case, the uh, gentleman had worked in the aviation industry for, for decades and had accepted a position with, the, with FAA um, and was coming in as a probationary employee, which means he has very few rights in terms of uh, due process rights uh, in disciplinary process. Um, but he uh, asked if he could perform, um, continue to have an outside business performing contract duties, contract work for some of these entities he'd worked with in the past. And so he did the right thing. He went to the ethics office. They met with him. They talked to him about it. They issued a written decision. 
um, a written opinion, I should say, about what he could do and warning him about things he should not be doing, and, um, and then off you go. He was so, uh, he starts his employment, serving a probationary period, and start, issues start to arise. Uh, there were some concerns with databases he was accessing, that whether or not they pertain to his actual job duties or whether it looked like he was trying to get information um, within, for, for, in his job to use for this outside business. Uh, he also uh, was at work at odd hours that he was not needed, he wasn't on duty. So that was a concern that was raised. And uh, he was reprimanded, he was, he was counseled about his activities, he did not stop them and ultimately he was fired during his probationary period because of concerns about his activities violating the ethics um, guidance he'd received. Now, this gentleman, as I said, filed an MS, fi filed, you know, went to the OSC um, and got clearance uh, to proceed at the, M at the MSPB um, on an individual right of action appeal, which means that, you know, uh, even though he didn't have MSPB rights, um, you know, he, he was raising an allegation of whistleblower reprisal and so the MSPB will hear his case. So right out, right there, it's a different, little bit different from the disciplinary action cases that we've been talking about. But, so he was able to establish that he was in fact a whistleblower. So just like in the Newton case, the judge turns to the agency, all right agency, now you have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that you would have fired this person notwithstanding their whistleblower activities. And the agency was able to prove that pretty convincingly, well, well convincingly, and pretty, in pretty short shrift because um, they had this evidence. They had documentation of the guidance given. They had, you know, evidence that they were in fact um, concerns about his conduct in the workplace based on him exceeding the parameters he'd been given for his conduct. Um, you know, taking into account the ethics concerns that have been raised. And so it, the judge said, that's a legitimate reason. I, it's supported by uh, clear and convincing evidence, so I'm going to sustain the removal action. So those are just cases, I think, that show you, again, you know, the importance of things like documentation, uh, because we have two situations where ethics um, our issues are raised, and we have one, we have dispositive information about what you know, the ethics opinion was and the, what the concerns of the agency were. In the other case, we have a paucity of that. We have you know, you know, other issues that convinced the judge that not only were the charges not supported and they were weak, but the timing of the person's disclosures and uh, the start of an investigation kind of trumped the, the charges that the agency was trying to bring. So again, I think those are interesting cases for comparison purposes and, um, and I particularly urge you again to read the Newton case which talks about that 502 issue. So that's all I have for today for, for my, my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you might have about anything I've talked about today. Okay, uh, Nikia, if we could open up the lines for folks who are on the phone um, who, who have some questions. Yes, thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question from the phone, please press star 1 and record your first and last name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment, please, for a first question. And we do have a question uh, in on the Hangout, and I think this is a clarification of the requirements for reporting to OGE. Okay. Uh, we know that we have to report to OGE when there are referrals for criminal violations of the conflict of interest statutes. Does that extend to uh, violations of 18 U.S.C. Section 207, the post-employment restrictions? Um, in terms of reporting to, if there is a referral if to the Department of Justice, yes, right, it includes yeah. it includes um, all of the criminal conflict of interest statutes. So. Um, 207 would fall within the ambit of that, so yes, there would be a recording, reporting requirement to OGE for that, for any referral. Excellent. And uh, the, the next question we have is, uh, in your uh, research, Diana, have you come across any disciplinary actions taken against employees for violations of the ethics pledge? No. I have not seen any of those. Interesting. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not showing any more questions on the Hangout. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nikia, do we have any questions on the phone? Yes, we do have a question from okay. Alisa Yoko. Your line is open. Hi, um, my question is this. You mentioned in the Henny v. DOD case that um, it, it would be a, a defense if a person failed to attend ethics training. And it seems to me that that would imply that there's a significant loophole for an employee who simply failed to attend 
intent training, even though it was made available to them, and I was wondering if you had any comments relating to that. Well, if I if I left the impression that it was a defense, I think that I would not <laughs> I would not uh, I don't think it's certainly not a complete defense. I think that at most, um, if you, if someone did not get training, it might affect the uh, the penalty determination um, because you know notice of of um, being aware of whether of the rule that you violated is important in the penalty phase um, of of an MSPB case. But I think you know. In this case, in the Henny case, I think what we're really trying to, to un, un emphasize is that the MSPB really looked at the fact that this person had repeatedly had ethics training mm -hmm. as, as not only an aggravating factor in the penalty, but also, you know, it kind of undercut his argument that, you know, he was confused about um, who the source of, of this uh, gift of, of attendance, um, a payment of the attendance fee for a conference. So I think that, you know, I would not say that avoiding or, you know, it, it would, give, lead, would lead to a useful defense for an employee, uh, at, not at all. I, I think that at most, you know, there might be circumstances where somebody was brand new and maybe didn't, didn't have ethics training yet or something like that where it could be a factor in how serious the discipline would be. But I would no, by no means say that not having training is a defense. So thank you for letting me clarify that. At this time, there are no further questions from the phone. Uh, likewise on the Hangout. Okay. Well, I think there are a couple of, at least I've, I've got a couple of takeaways that I'm taking away from sure, this. Number okay. one is that, I mean, advice and counsel matters and documenting it matters because clearly that makes a difference in the agency being able to sustain what the employee did or didn't know or what the agency may or may not have have advised, correct? That's absolutely true, and, and as our guidance says in our, our legal advisory, the more senior the employee, the more complex the situation, the more important it is to have documentation. So again, I would urge the participants to go look at that guidance and um, and make sure that they you know, utilize it in the appropriate circumstances. The other one is clearly training matters and documenting training matters because as you said that is sort of the notice to the employee about what conduct is appropriate or inappropriate um, and and you've you've documented like two or three different cases right where they said training was at least a factor that was considered in, in some point in the case. Absolutely uh, absolutely and I think that you know we have ethics training for a reason yeah. because we want people to have that message reinforced and you know we recognize that the, the standards are, are not you know easy to recall and we can't we can't expect people to remember everything in detail but they have enough to know that that little question comes up in your mind you cannot just forge ahead you need to go talk to your ethics official to get some information and some guidance about what you can, can and can't do and then the final thing I just noticed and is, is sort of a reiteration that in, in many of these cases um, the MSPB brings a sort of a, a commonsensical view to the table in terms of does do the optics, do the totality of the circumstances appear that we've met more of a conceptual notion of an ethics violation which is sort of the use of public office for private gain or no preferential treatment. Um, so I think sometimes ethics officials are concerned about establishing a, a violation of a p very specified articulated standard in the standards of conduct but I think as some of these cases today showed the MSPB often will be looking at these sort of broader principles of, of ethical conduct and that can be sufficient to sustain a charge at least. Absolutely and I think and, and what I would also say about that Cheryl is that you know, you know we hearken back to the fact that the agency makes the charge and the agency has to be able to sustain the charge. So what I think this also shows is that even though you may be charging a more broad kind of, you know, aspirational type of charge, mm -hmm. you can still, that charge can still support a significant disciplinary action. So you may not have, you know, the evidence to support a more detailed, mm -hmm. a specific thing, but you still have those 14 principles that may be um, important in a disciplinary action. Well, thank you again very much, Diana. This has been very, very helpful, I'm sure, to everyone out there. And as Diana promised, we will have a handout that we will be sending to you, either with the email that we send you, with the evaluation form, or with a subsequent email. And we do encourage you, please, to fill out your evaluation forms because we do take your comments uh, very seriously. Um, and so that's all for us for today. I want to thank Diana again, and thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.